yes yes if, yes, if, yes. If, if agrees to it prashant yeah. as to yeah yeah so uh, uh, mr sharma are we ready okay so uh, so shumon you can open it up and i just start with the brief yeah please start okay so a uh, very good afternoon ladies and gentlemen welcome to the e seminar on the indian healthcare sector and analysis where we are going to discuss the healthcare industry under the current circumstances and the way forward uh, at icc we have been doing uh, quite a few sessions in uh, the healthcare segment and uh, some of you have been regularly attending these sessions and uh, the response uh, has been uh, quite encouraging for us uh we have a very strong and knowledgeable panel with us this afternoon and we look forward to hearing their thoughts on the subject i think this is the first time probably that a uh national chamber has taken up uh, the issue of the healthcare uh, in the form of a e seminar uh, especially now in 2020 so uh we will go into the discussions but before that uh, may i request uh, mr prashant sharma managing director charnock hospital kolkata and chairman of the icc healthcare committee to share his opening remarks mr sharma thank you sujay very good afternoon to everybody a very warm welcome to this indian health e seminar on indian healthcare sector and analysis our distinguished speakers Dr. Alice Thompson, President of Indian Association of Healthcare Providers of India. From the pharma sector, we have Mr. Mahesh Doshi, who is the National President for Indian Drug Manufacturers Association. From the medical devices sector, we have Mr. Rajiv Nath, Forum Coordinator, Association of Indian Medical Devices Industry. And we also have the privilege of having a renowned economist, Dr. Mohan Guru Swami, who is a former advisor to Ministry of Finance, Government of India, Chairman and Founder of CPA. now uh, i would leave the introduction of all the speakers to my esteemed colleague dr vikram raghubanshi dr vikram raghubanshi has a unique experience of hospital operations having simultaneously operated over 10 hospitals and has been the ceo of the top hospital brands in the last 10 years 28 years he has designed and built over 45 hospitals in india and overseas dr singh was instrumental in mna in healthcare space with over 4000 crores of investment as part of the faculty of tata institute of social studies at mumbai he has created capacity to train over 400 hospital managers who literally run the private healthcare sector in a very significant fashion he is a pioneer of tech a medical graduate with masters in healthcare and mba from fms delhi and leadership training at harvard dr singh brings rich experience in our domain and during this very challenging time and this unprecedented uh, situation it is important that the entire gamut of services of health care sector whether it is uh, the provider space being hospitals the pharma sector the med device sector the it the finance everybody comes in together and pitches in so that we can we are able to tide over not this not just the current situation but also prepare for the economic uh, impact of this entire 3 or 4 month of disastrous journey with this i hand over to dr raghavanshi to kindly take this forward sincere thanks uh, prashant uh, really appreciate not many people know that uh, prashant sharma is the flag, flag bearer of healthcare in east of india and he has been contributing over a decade and uh, really worked with most leading healthcare players to help us and direct us so kind of you to give this opportunity it's my honor and pleasure to coordinate this session a very briefly indian health sector and analysis this is broadly that we are going to discuss over an hour today entire world is in, impacted by covid 19 pandemic in a manner that none of us ever imagined uh, we have been talking about challenges in healthcare in under developed countries developing countries developed world but the situation that we witnessed today none of us really imagine in the short span of just 3 months our way of life has changed 
global economy is on a downward spiral and there is no insight to any remedy in immediate future countries are not able to handle sudden load to their healthcare systems and despite the best effort most of the countries are struggling to match up unemployment interpersonal social issues new way of working from home people are losing jobs there are salary reduction the misery that unorganized sector and the daily wages people are witnessing has been uh, not seen in near uh, memory suffering of migrant laborers is really very hard and painful to see and we are witnessing new challenges every day so today discussion will aim to cover through our uh, eminent speakers immediate and mid term impact on health care delivery on medical consumable and medical device including medical equipments on workplace and way we will require to adopt new approach and practices and about all how economic impact will determine this recovery in near future i will briefly uh, introduce this august speakers that we have today uh, all four speakers are institutions in themselves dr alexander thomas president association of healthcare provider for over 30 years dr alexander is serving health sector with his immense personal experience and his interaction with end users not many people know that uh, dr alexander is, is a eminent orthopedician by training he holds leadership position in several national association related to health sector we have uh, uh, mr manish h doshi national president indian drug manufacturer association for over 30 years he is key person in indian drug manufacturing association it was his vision to form a think tank for pharma industry i have been going through some of his lectures and the way you have stood like a pillar for this sector is really noteworthy we have uh, with us mr rajiv nath a very known voice in medtech space one of the person everybody rushes in north india for any help that they seek with the government body mr rajiv nath has been forum coordinator association of indian medical device he is managing director of hindustan citizens and medical device for most of us who are not much aware about consumable sector this is the pioneering company which started from scratch and today is the top medtech company in india with over 600 crore annual turnover he represent country on multiple multilateral forums like who and unicef he is a dependable link between industry and government agency i also have fortune to introduce mr mohan guruswami he on most uh, leading tv channels his insight into finance and economics is noteworthy mr mohan was former advisor to finance ministry government of india and he is chairman and founder of center for policy advocacy alternatives he is known authority on economy and financial fundamentals he has a great insight on science and technology globalization social economic challenges that our country faces and it is this space that will help us to recover fast because end of the day it is economy that will propel the recovery phase i now request my honor to request dr alexander to give a brief note of uh, on what he feels about the present challenges what is that uh, we need to adopt and how you foresee the immediate and short term situation in health sector space
Thank you. Thank you, Vikram, and thank you for inviting me to this very uh, uh, important uh, meeting. Uh, let me start off by saying that, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've spent my entire life in mission hospital service. And so uh, I'm sort of a neutral observer. And after coming out of retirement, we formed this association. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you is uh, based, uh, we have a weekly meeting of all our chapter presidents all over the country. Having said that, yes, we are living in an unprecedented situation. I think uh, for many of us, this is a lifetime experience and we hope we don't have to see this again. Now the question on many, uh, many people's minds is, is the, was the lockdown necessary? To my mind, as a clinician, I think it has been very useful and it has brought down the, it has definitely slowed down the pandemic. I think we're all very uh, aware the growth rate has gone, the uh, growth rate of active cases uh, is slowing down, though yesterday and day before, I think we had the highest spike. Chain of transmission has definitely reduced. And most important, we are in a uh, state of preparedness. I think Bombay is one city which is, uh, all the beds are full, they're finding it difficult to uh, treat all the patients. But for most uh, other parts of the country, uh, just about 5 to 10% of the beds which were kept ready have, are being used. We hope we don't reach the stage of uh, Bombay. Now, how do, you, how do you say that we think that uh, the lockdown has benefited? The numbers are coming down. You may say that, yeah, the testing is not available, so how can you go by the numbers? There are three other uh, indicators. One is there is a disease surveillance pro uh, program which monitors all the flu-like symptoms in the country. That has shown that there is no sudden spike in this type of illness. Uh, COVID-19 is a respiratory illness. Hospital admissions for respiratory illness have not gone up. And uh, even if you consider testing, the test positivity rate is very, very much less compared to the other states. Now, having said that, uh, uh, I, I think to my mind, the most uh, uh, reliable indicator is the mortality. And I think uh, God has been kind to India. Our mortality has been much, much less in many other countries. And I think we have to uh, appreciate the government for what they have done. Having uh, now looking at the uh, present situation in the health sector, I think this was uh, something that nobody saw coming. And if you look at the hospital uh, sector today, the health delivery sector, the secondary and tertiary systems, we are in the doldrums. Most, uh, uh, the health sector in India is not the corporate sector. Uh, corporate sector is about 8 to 10 percent. The health delivery is by the smaller hospitals, the 5 to 10 beds up to 50 beds. And they are in very, very difficult times. Uh, as you know, most of our uh, colleagues are health professionals. We have no training in finance. We have no training in cash flows uh, and to keep something for a rainy day. And in these last two months, because of the sphere psychosis, because of the lockdown, the non-COVID patients have almost stopped coming to the hospital. Mercifully, in the last week, that has improved. But for almost uh, two months, uh, and uh, this is uh, on an average, I'd say that having talked to all my state presidents, inpatients came down to almost 10%. Uh, you must understand that the in most places, the government has said that they will take care of the COVID patients. So uh, very few of the COVID patients go to the private sector. But on an average, both the small hospitals, the medium hospitals, and the large hospitals, inpatients have come down to, had come down to 10%, the outpatients were about 10%, and elective surgery had come to zero. So this is what brings in the, the money. So uh, imagine that there's no cash flow. Many smaller hospitals had to close down and many have not been able to pay their uh, staff their stipends because there has been no income. And I think all of you being in the industry, you know that uh, the health sector was not a very good place to be even before the COVID uh, started coming in. Coming back to the COVID, I think uh, one of the reasons we have uh, 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 relatively uh, low incidence and uh, the mortality is uh, so low is that we are the country with the largest group of younger professionals and we have a large rural population. Of course, now we are seeing the results of the migrants going back and having infected uh, the rural population. But I think having said that, it's still, uh, compared to other countries, it is uh, much less. 
I think one of the areas that we have to keep in mind, even in this pandemic, uh, as it runs its course and in future uh, uh, pandemics, is protection of the frontline worker. And I think this is one area where we were caught napping. Um, there was stigma to all, many of the health workers who worked in this, they were not allowed to go back to their flats. People were not allowed to bury the dead. It was absolutely terrible and unfortunate. Um, and I think this is something that the government, the media, and society should take uh, note of. Of course, the government did take some action. The ordinance was promulgated. The prime minister repeatedly came on TV. They announced life insurance for those who uh, lose their lives. And in Orissa, I think they've taken a very uh, proactive stand. Uh, uh, HP had asked for this, and they said that anybody who uh, loses their lives in the battle against COVID will be treated as martyrs. So I think this is something that we have to learn. It, it is still there. I think the media, the government, we have to try and fight this fear psychosis. And the panic that is there, uh, we, we should address it. So looking at it very realistically and based on figures, the mortality in this disease is just 1.4% compared to SARS, which is 9.6%. So this is something that we need to uh, keep in mind. And instead of this disease causing a division and a stigma. I think it's time that society came to uh, together and uh, fought this together. Uh, important that uh, testing is available even as we speak. Many states, the Northeast has no testing center as of today. Uh, the work environment, um, people who wear these suits can hardly work for more than four to six hours. It's important that they are looked after. And very important, the health of the hospitals per se. And when I say health of the hospital, a lot of other factors, there is not enough time to go in. Unless the hospitals and the healthcare providers are healthy, it would be difficult to provide uh, good treatment to the patients. Very quickly, what would be the exit strategy? Before going into the exit strategy, I think it's important that the government realizes, uh, and HP has been saying this for many, many years now, that the government should have a major share of the health providers in the, private, uh, in the, in the health space. If you look at it today, 70% of the uh, healthcare is provided by private players, only 30% by the government. This has to change. I think all of us um, would remember 30, 40 years, used to get quality treatment in government hospitals. I think we should put in measures to ensure that that happens. And there are islands of excellence. We have the JDM Institute of Cardiology, we have Nimbanks. I think every district hospital, every taluk hospital, every government hospital should be made centers of excellence. And it's not very difficult to implement this. Quickly, and now that the lockdown has been lifted, what you, uh, the exit strategy, and we have actually uh, sent this to the government of India, the government of Karnataka also has taken note of this. So we divide our patients into group A, group B, C, and D. Group A is those who are not infected. Group B is probably infected, asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic. Group C is the infected and severe illness. And group D, this is a group which I think we have forgotten in all this the person's uh, patients with non-COVID diseases. That has actually uh, led to a lot of problems. So very quickly, the guidelines in the early stages of mild infection, a rigorous isolation, contact tracing, and quarantine at home. And in our country, I think many people do not have the facility for this. I think special community isolation centers wherever required, like many states are doing. Uh, the hospital care for COVID-19 should be reserved only for severe infections, as we're seeing more and more cases. And again, at a cost of repetition, non-COVID conditions should receive equal importance. And our health services should be geared that in the event of a pandemic, we should not forget our heart attacks, our strokes, our elder population. All of them are, to a great extent, suffering now. Uh, we had actually suggested to the government, learning from our uh, experience from the experience in Italy that they should not be a mix up of patients and the government has strictly implemented this. There is a COVID system where there are only COVID hospitals and the private hospitals mostly take care of the non-COVID uh, patients. A silver lining in this whole episode is a teleconsultation. HPI has been trying now for almost three years to get it legalized. They're facing a lot of obstruction. Fortunately for us, this has now been legalized. This will help in many ways. Convenience for the patient, uh, the hospital system will not be overwhelmed. They also, I think all of us know that this uh, lockdowns and this disease has uh, uh, created a lot of mental stress and uh, helplines have been set up uh, uh, which are being used. 
uh, one thing that we also need to remember is that our culture in India, we have the, uh, the advantage of Ayush, and there are many method methodologies and medicines in Ayush which improve the immunity of the population, and this be, should be used. These are general guidelines for those who are not infected. Physical distancing, wearing masks, basic hand and surface hygiene, respiratory etiquette, avoidance of social gatherings, and again. Ayush preventive guidelines should be put in place. Group B, those who are probably infected, you know, asymptomatic or mild symptomatic. See, we are learning more and more about the disease as every day, uh, every day goes by. And one of the things which is now coming out is the non-symptomatic COVID carriers do not spread too much as compared to those who are symptomatic. So for these, you need home isolation for mild symptomatic cases. The family need to, needs to be home quarantined. There should be community isolation, as mentioned earlier. And use what we have in our country. Ayush is very effective, both in terms of outcomes and in terms of cost. The severe illnesses, I don't think there is any uh, question about this, that they should be uh, immediately, uh, the authority should be uh, contacted and they should reach a COVID hospital. Now, a little bit about non-COVID conditions. Uh, now the hospitals are opening and I'm glad to say that in the last week or 10 days, outpatients have improved, inpatients have improved, some sort of elective surgery has uh, has started. And HPI has brought out a detailed document on how the, the doctors and nurses, etc. should protect themselves. Because testing is not foolproof. There's a 30% false negative. So we have to take universal precautions. I think the hospitals now which deal with non-COVID conditions, there has to be a separate place for fever where you can triage. There has to be distancing at outpatient facilities. We need to use technology so that there is no contact, um, you know, for example, counting money, etc. Segregation of uh, patients into different groups. And I think we need to bring in the culture of appointment systems even for general patients so that they don't come in and uh, crowd the hospitals. There has to be strict maintenance of prevention protocols by care providers at all levels. So finally, to close, I'd say that we were looking forward to the government to help bail out the health industry. And I think we are here from different sectors. You may ask, you know, every sector has had its problem. Uh, hotel sector is closed down. Many other small businesses have closed down. But I think it's important that to fight the pandemic per se and also to continue the care of those non-COVID patients, it's important that hospital systems are healthy and running. And we have suggested to the government that they, they could, and they have already helped out in a few ways. They have released the dues of ECHS, CPHS, etc. But what we are asking now is whether hospitals could get soft loans so that they could tide over this crisis till they are financially and uh, viable and that they could continue to provide quality, affordable and accessible health care to the uh, community. Thank you very much. Again. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Very precisely covered almost every aspect that we wanted to know. Uh, we will come back to question and answer later in the discussion. However, there are few very pertaining questions that our colleagues keep asking. One, what you already covered, is suffering by non-COVID patient. And yesterday, I was talking to a cardiologist. And he said that there's an acute MI case that came to hospital. The hospital authorities told the patient that patient will undergo a COVID. Then the COVID report will come. So where is the uh, uh, primary PTC possible now? So these are impractical situations that clinicians at workplaces are facing. Also, it's a huge population of non-COVID who are so fearful that they are not, not going to hospital. Not everybody has uh, personal access to doctors, though in last 10, 15 days, a lot of teleconsultation opportunities are available. But because they are not able to visit hospitals, not able to get basic tests like chest x-ray, people are uh, deteriorating in their chronic, chronic illness. Also, uh, Initially, we had few COVID cases, government initiated lockdown at right time, but there is a criticism that initial number of tests were so limited that 
it did not cover the entire uh, uh, targeted population and today we are seeing this rapid rise which is uh, by default going to rise we all know as clinicians and now people are talking about home quarantine for non affected people so there are burning questions that still stay now you mentioned north is there is not a, a single diagnostic was it a right approach to totally ignore private sector today we understand that tertiary and eye and care is much better in private sector india has capability of huge diagnostic network but because of policy delay we could not set up 1000 to 2000 testing centers so i'll be coming back to you with few of these questions but briefly will you uh, like to cover few points yeah sure uh, the first one uh, yeah i i do agree with you that um, i think the private uh, health does uh, add great value to the health systems of the country they bring in the latest technology the latest uh, state of the art uh, treatments and make it available to the common man uh, what is the first question uh, vikram i the first one see was... the first question was that a uh, lot of non covid patients have suffered immensely yes. because uh, not everybody has easy access to clinicians and this fear of going out and getting affected and this whole quarantine policy of 14 days in setups which are not uh, very well furnished so people avoided even going to hospitals for their genuine needs yeah i think it's a problem it's uh, th- there is an issue of communication and i think that's where i think we need to learn from this and in future uh, it's not only that i think the uh, this uh, fear was so bad that they started attacking the doctors the nurses etc you all heard about it. yes so yes. i think communication is absolutely crucial one of the things that the government did um, Yeah, but they did not really publicize was having a separate covid system i think if patients knew that there was a separate covid system they would have started going back to hospitals so that is only started uh, later uh, teleconsultation uh, i think it's uh, it's come in as a big boon now and uh, now that it has been legalized i, I think it, it's um, in most of the states they have a helpline you know, where uh, the common man can reach out So to some extent they have, and I think in almost all the states, for uh, people who need quarantine, because as I said, we are still learning about the disease. So I think it's better to be safe than sorry. So in most places, like in Karnataka, for example, uh, uh, the government has made arrangements for quarantine of people who cannot who do not have the facilities at home. But having said that, I think many of our uh, uh, fellow citizens um, try to hide behind the fact that they've been in touch with COVID. Again, I think it's how we communicate communicate to them and i think we need to communicate that this is a crisis that we all have to face together it's not each one for itself because this is one disease where your actions will affect the life or the health of another thank you thank you dr alexander now it is my pleasure to invite uh, mr mahesh h doshi a pioneer in pharmaceutical industry with such a vast experience and uh, who is interacting with end users on day in and day out uh, this sector is kind of a backbone for uh, health sector and i like your insight into the situation what are the solutions and what are the advice to both hospitals government agencies and people at large thank you <clears throat> श्री प्रसाद शर्मा जी चेयरमैन आईसीसी नेशनल हेल्थ कमेटी हेल्थ केयर कमेटी डॉक्टर विक्रम रघुवंशी जी माय को पेनालिस्ट माय फ्रेंड मिस्टर नाथ डॉक्टर गुरुस्वामी एंड डॉक्टर अलेक्सेंडर आई एम वेरी हैप्पी हैविंग बीन इनवाइटेड टू पार्टिसिपेट इन आईसीसी ई सेमिनार ऑन इंडियन हेल्थ केयर सेक्टर एंड एनालिस टूडे एज इज द न्यू नॉर्मल दिस डेज we we are all participating in the e seminar by vc my heartiest congratulation and best wishes to all of you on the memorable occasion before my starting a uh, subject i will just in a one minute i will say a pre lockdown on the 21st what was happened the covid 19 pandemic 
has a seriously affected functioning of the pharmaceutical industry as well as the ancillary industry. As the pandemic broke out and started impacting India, our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Bhai Modi ji organized a video conference on 21st March. With I was there with a few ca captain of the industry. In that only means he has a taken the assurance from the us and we assured the prime minister that there is a enough stock of medicine in the market and there will be no any shortage anywhere any day in the country the prime minister announced and after today's prime minister is announced the national lockdown so i if i will start starting my subject on live saying like that there are more people live than have ever died. We are 7 billion plus people on planet Earth. Statistically, this is a more than some of the people that have ever lived or died. And the population is a growing. All these, all these people need basic for survival, roti, kapda, makan, and healthcare. Effectively, we are at a point where there is a greater need for a healthcare than it ever was. The current pandemic has made the need for healthcare even more pressing than weaper. In this time of a crisis, the Indian pharma industry has emerged as the unsung hero. India is the primary supply of essential medicine to a more than 100 country and its supply spread is across 200 country. The current pandemic has therefore brought this industry into a global focus and we say India is a pharmacy of the world. What was once thought to be the bottle of lies is now world's bottle of life, the Amrit Kalasa. As the president of IDMA, that is a truly the voice of national pharma industry, let me highlight some of its trends. In terms of Indian healthcare industry, almost $100 billion. Pharma industry make about 20%, 20 billion domestic market size. 6% is the medical devices industry not correct me if I'm wrong, industry, almost 60% is the hospital industry, the balance is the service industry and others. Hence, we are the second most important element of the entire healthcare ecosystem in India. In total, this industry size is about 40 billion US dollar, equally split between domestic market and export, uh, export market. Financial year 1920, India export was at $20.58 billion, growing at 7.6 annually. First three quarter growth was 11.5%, was reduced in the last quarter due to the export logistic disruption as a port wide dysfunctional. Yeah. FY 1920, domestic market was estimated to be a rupees 1.45 lakh crore approximate 19.6 billion US dollar at a growth rate of 9.8 annually. India stayed third in world in export in term of its volume, almost 20% of volume. India stayed 11th in the world in export in term of value, almost 3.3% value. Total global market size is about 1.3 trillion US dollar. Total international trade in pharma is around 460 billion, billion US dollar yearly. Yeah. Here, here you can very well, very well judge that. In a volume, we are third in the world and in value, we are 11th in the world. That means our medicine is a very affordable and a cheap. India stands fourth in the world in terms of the foreign exchange earner. India has the highest number of US FDA plant outside USA, say approximately more than 550 plants. India has also very high number of EU approved plant also, about 600. This figure I'm giving you because layman, means my, all our listeners should understand that India's pharmaceutical industry is a cheap. It does not mean that we, we are not quality conscious. India is a very, very, very quality conscious country. Having a, this vast you have, uh, international approval, in the in the India, further India D, India DPCO that's a drug price control ordinance ensure that the essential medicine in India are 
one of the most affordable globally. Sold at a fraction of a price at which the same products are sold elsewhere in the world. This can be achieved due to Indian industry's core strengths such as technical expertise to produce global quality at a low cost using alternative route of synthesis, low cost of a skilled manpower, well-developed formulation industry, focus on with GMP, that's a good manufacturing compliance, efficiency in India, regulatory, efficiency, Indian regulatory system, and the entrepreneurial risk-taking above all. Indian formulation industry is the, means industry is divided in a two part. That's one is a formulation and another is the API. That's the active pharmaceutical in India. Indian formulation industry is the manufacturer of almost 40% of medicines sold in developed world, the US and EU. One in every five pills sold worldwide originated in India. Almost two out of three vaccines. That means I can say 60% vaccine manufacturing capacity and production are available in India. One of the important limitations that is uh, we have a one in a pharma industry in formulation, uh, our flag is a flying like anything, but we have a one limitation that is in the production of the API. That domains of API industry that could not survive in the strong record. Fortunately, PM recently has announced a strong package of about 1,000 crore that aims at strengthening the API industry and device industries. If it goes as planned, India can become almost self-sufficient in the 52 API on which we are eight, more than 80% depend on the China as on today in next three to five years. This could be a game changer for the nation with end-to-end -end supply chain from API to finished product under our domain. That's a 1,000 crore rupees Prime Minister has announced to, for the pharmaceutical industry. That is for the production of the 52 API, which on 100, practically 100% 100 we are as on today, API, dependent on the China. Means that's a majority is coming by the fermentation also. Uh, in a fermentation industry, if I will say, Till 70, 80, 90, India was the exporter of that of fermentation product from India to China. But after changing the policy in the China, means they have given the lot of subsidy, then a big scale, big volume, and so many other factors, they were more competitive than us. I can say or rather they were selling less than the cost. So India was not competitive in those days. So slowly, slowly that major API production has stopped from India. So now since 2014, our association has come out with the white paper. That's the API industry vision for the 2020. And we constantly talking with the government to revival of the API industry. Ultimately with this major pandemic, government realized that if we will not take this issue, this issue as a national security, then one day trouble can arrive. So this new program has also come uh, of the API production. And as I told you, if it will go okay, then in three to five years, India will become again, now what you say, self suffice in the, in the bird drug also. Further augment this industry, ID, IDMA member have also been working to focus on a drug discovery, the new drug delivery system, this one evolved, can add the additional two to the industry when India, Indian industry will have full scale strength from research to retail, from bands to sell. And that would be the India's new era of a global domains. This is, if I will say, <clears throat> about a little, little about the uh, my association, that's in IDMA. IDMA was a form in the year 1961 and is the only association in, in India with a membership strain of over 1,000 plus member. Wholly on, wholly on Indian small, medium and a large scale pharmaceutical manufacturers situated throughout the length and breadth of our country. IDMA has the premier national association, has successfully completed 58 glorious year 
of providing support to its member who have provided affordable quality medicine not only to the people of india but also to the people all all over the world if i will say i want to say a little bit about the post covid situation what will happen to our industry when nothing but what we say it will be the same position like other other industry only demand it it is estimated that demand will reduce a certain category for medicine will have less demand as per example anti infective dermatology as people are indoor so the number of infection will be less since the medical doctors are not practicing it is expected there will be a fall in demand case crunch due to the fall in a sales there will be a case case flow crunch will be also there export temporarily it is affected but once it will be a normalized we hope that export will be a, at their original speed mm -hmm. like all industry pharmaceutical industry too will face a shortage of main power also so this is the expecting by the all the industry and uh, with the support of the government and uh, self reliance uh, prime minister says on the atmanirbhar bharat so i will say pharmaceutical industry is a atmanirbhar not only for the india but in the world also entire world is looking towards us 70% of the total demand of the hydroxy chloroquine has been fulfilled by our country obviously first we have created the buffer stock for our country then we have exported to the entire world so this is this this is a very good opportunity means what to say in this pandemic indian pharma industry got it and uh, hopefully we will take a benefit out of this and uh, very shortly hoping a vaccination will come yesterday only we have had the news from the german lab as well as the oxford uh, team is also working and oxford team is working with our indian company that's a an institute of serum institute of india and which that plus other two company all all total capacity more than the 60% of the world requirement vaccination are producing in india so one thing is very sure wherever the vaccine will uh, research will come production will come to the india and india is a safe we will get the enough stock from that also lastly the lockdown is likely to open up a phase out manner but certain strict norms would have to be followed physical seminar and training program would be difficult to be conducted and organized and we would have to rely more and more on video conferencing and webinar i am glad by initiative taken by icc and i am sure other would follow suit thank you very much thank you mr doshi some of the figures and facts that you mentioned were new, really news to us not many people are aware in such depth about pharma sector but let me assure you like it pharma is our pride and indian products are kind of respected globally and the ca capacity and capability that you mentioned we are confident that we will be at the forefront globally and i am very happy that one of the segment where we lost api the government initiative will help us to regain our uh, uh, lost ground which will really make us self dependent rather than depending on other countries however later in the discussion we will have few questions related to pharma we don't know much because as dr alexander mentioned that most hospitals are operating at 10 to 20% of occupancy so what is its impact on the pharma in terms of uh, top line growth or degrowth what are the challenges of uh, reopening your uh, factories because there is still movement restriction and uh, also very critical is to maintain viability of industry people have a fear of job loss so how your sector is going to cover this if you can touch very briefly on these yes vikram uh, first of all means I, i have just told you regarding the demand so obviously demand will come under the pressure uh, in a domestic market 
as well as internationally also demand is in the pressure. Occupancy at the hospital at the 10% or 20% or a, my physician or my GP are not going to the dispensary and they are not meeting to the patients. So automatically there also demand will, uh, will come under the pressure. But we, hopeful, we hopefully that, let me tell you, we believe that let's medicine for the million, million are not for the medicine. So that way doctors will go slowly, slowly the occupancy in the hospital will be increased. So one would, one may be a one more quarter, there will be a pressure for the demand, but it will come on the line. Hopefully it will become on the line. Second, regarding the, what we say, restarting of the factory, uh, let me tell you today, our pharma industry practically today, as of today, it's a working on a practically in the 60 to 70% capacity. Thanks to the government of India's state government, district magistrate all, they have initially with a lot of teething problem, logistic problem, labor problem. They have helped us to run the factory and uh, for the labor, time to time they have changed the policy. Uh, so at least uh, job loss won't be there much in the pharma industry. I think we realize this is the only one industry. Where so here on the contrary we require more labor more more people as on today so okay. that's a I, I fully I visualize that's a good news for us yeah. sincere thanks sincere thanks so now I take this opportunity to invite uh, our voice in health sector to the government Mr Rajiv Nath to cover consumable medtech space and bit also on uh, medical equipment because you may be knowing better than any of us. So, all yours, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Raghavanshi and uh, ICC for organizing this uh, excellent webinar, very timely so. Well, uh, what we have is a war going on. And as just briefed to you by Mr. Doshi, exactly two months back, in preparedness of this war, the Prime Minister had a meeting with the Pharma Associations and with IMED as the Medical Device Association asking us to gear up and make sure that the doctors and the soldiers who are fighting this war and who need the pharmaceutical bullets will not fall short of the guns, the armor and the tents or the missile launchers which are required to fight this war. And within a couple of days, the lockdown was announced. And this took us by surprise. But it was a well thought strategy because it allowed a build up of the medical equipment and the inventory of medical equipment that on today's date, when we are now more advanced in the war, we also have more confidence to fight this war. And why the confidence has come politically and by bureaucrats is because Nearly 24 by 7, since March 20th, we've been on, I would say, extraordinary communication. This kind of teamwork we have never seen in our life. The Secretary of Pharma, two joint Secretaries of Pharma, along with India Invest, along with Secretary DIPP, along with his joint Secretary, Deputy Secretaries, along with the staff of DHR, along with the Secretary of Textile and the Joint Secretary and his staff. From 7 o'clock in the morning till 1 o'clock at night, there used to be a bombardment of questions, queries. Who makes what? How much can be made? What are the capacities? Can you gear up more? Fortunately, we had already spent the problem. And in the first week of February, we had already sounded the government that this is what we are importing. This is our current capacity and I told the manufacturers that time please ramp up your capacity they said by how much 30 percent 40 percent I said no at least 4x or 5x but in March and I was telling them it needs to be at least 10 times and even that will not be enough and we need more players to come in and you've seen the rush so by teamwork you can move mountains and that's what's been done. From having a position where our industry was totally neglected, 
with 80 to 90 percent import dependency last year's imports have crossed 42000 crore rupees we are coming to a position whereby everybody is now looking at medical devices people have diversified from making garments to making ppe travel agencies have diversified into making ppe because they see no future in travel agencies hotel industry has diversified restaurant people have diversified paint manufacturers like asian paints whiskey drinkers and manufacturers of whiskey they are making sanitizers who thought automotive people will be making ventilators we had a barrage of phone calls coming in from maruti from ashok leyland from honda please link up us with the manufacturers can you give us the technology from where we can get this from where we can get that for everything i met became the nodal point of communication and of information data mining so the only area where we were i would say comfortable was gloves in the covid so we had about 20 manufacturers listed and then we looked around and we found six more so 26 manufacturers with a capacity of 2 to 2.4 billion pieces per year which was quite sufficient for the country but the who's who in the government got a complete shock when we told them that we make zero examination gloves in the country why you have got 25 or 26 of these manufacturers you make it 2 and 1/2 billion of these gloves and you don't make examination gloves no sir we don't if we are making 2 and 1/2 billion surgical gloves we are importing 3 and 1/2 billion examination gloves and the same manufacturers are doing that and why do they do that why don't they make sir because the custom duty is zero and the raw material duty to import latex from malaysia is 60% my god and because 60% is the raw material duty given on malaysia latex the local manufacturers for latex in kerala they are have keeping the prices high and since our prices are high we are not able to compete so how are you competing in surgical gloves we are competing because we are going on the value addition on the quality product malaysia and china is making the low end of the market we are making the middle and high end of the market okay in masks we had about 20 manufacturers listed only in february when we were collecting the information with hardly 300 billion pieces per annum capacity on today's date we got more than 43 manufacturers listed and maybe 20 more machines are coming in as i speak to you and the capacity has gone up to 1.2 billion four times in two time amazing things are happening machines are coming in by air they are being installed and commissioned by indian engineers without seeking intervention of a foreign engineer this is the mother of evil invention in the case of pp they were about 20 odd manufacturers making about 6 million pieces of medical garments gowns and pp coveralls not zero as is being said now so about 20000 pieces per day but they were at loss because specifications were not clear so in the end of march finally we got to know what we have to make what specifications and now in ibet we've got about 40 listed manufacturers but we reached out to the garment manufacturers to the garment export promotion council and all the major garment manufacturers in gurgaon and delhi area and we motivated them to import the seam sealing machines and we give them the designs and the list of the raw material manufacturers who make the textile materials in india for this pp and immediately you see that currently now the latest figure is that more than 4 lakh pieces a day are being made we expect there will be a glut in the market in a couple of weeks weeks time and already it's happening because the prices have fallen so much that people are undercutting the quality and the pricing to sell their product and this is also a big danger because we have an unregulated market where every kind of quality is being sold then the issue came about testing so we had zero manufacturers for the extraction kits 
and now we've got eight manufacturers doing about eight billion pieces per year capacity. More will be coming up. Same thing for the PCR kits. We had zero manufacturing before, and in two months, we've got now five manufacturers with a capacity of 110 million pieces per annum. To make just the VTM, VTM is the viral transport medium or the tube in which after you do the swab, nose or throat, you will put that swab stick and we go to the testing laboratory for doing the actual tests. This was not being made in the country. Now, four manufacturers, six manufacturers have come forward and rapidly the manufacturing is being speeded up. But their problem came, so we can the tubes, we can make the cap and we can get the medium from high media, etc. But where do we get the swaps from? So now we've got three swap manufacturers whose capacity is 74 million pieces per annum. And now this has become the least of our problems from being the biggest headache. So by excellent teamwork, good communication, we've moved mountains. But at the same time, the manufacturers were dismayed that the government, instead of supporting and motivating them in certain respects like duties, is making life tough because we certainly have also a lot of imports coming in to compete with, with low duties. So in two weeks, we've seen the scenario change. In March, there was a huge shortage. Unlike pharma, Mr. Doshi and company had slightly eased because they had high inventory of medicines in the market, high inventory in the factories. So running the factory was not a priority for the government. That came only the beginning of April. But in March middle, the government was breathing down our necks and wanting us to ramp up capacities. So every of the issues that you've been hearing upon, whether for opening the factories, getting the permissions from the local administration to run the factories, not for only for yourself, but for our packaging materials, for the components, for the raw material. We said, sir, this permission is not enough. We need for the whole supply chain. But within 24 hours, Cabinet Secretary or 48 hours Cabinet Secretary, Mr. Rahul Baba used to listen to our issues and come back with a solution. Amazing speed. Never seen this before in the government. So we got issues. We can't run the factory without trucking. Trucks are not allowed. Okay, trucking allowed. We don't have courier service. Masks can't be made without the nose clips. And they can't go by trucks. We can't have a truck load. Okay, you can't have a truck load. What is the solution? So a lot of inventory lying of non-essential goods at least allow that to move. Okay, allowed. Even non-essentials can move by trucking. Workers. Okay, allowed. Certain local administrations were tough net nuts to crack. Damam, Badi, Noida. Repeatedly, the collector had to be called by NPPA, by DOP, and ask them to allow the companies to run. That these are essential goods. We had to go and tell them politely, essential goods mean that even you can be arrested if you block service on of this. So our manufacturers have to have the confidence. Components have to be transported from Pune to Andhra Pradesh zone. Interstate passes required. Everything was provided by IMED as temporary passes to put on their windscreens of their cars and for the trucks. Now, of course, we are thankful that I'm getting to hear Mr. Mohan Gurswami speak about the economy, but I've seen a shift taking place from the high demand in March to a crash or petering of demand in the end of April. There was a seminar we had done on the 30th of April where we were at about 20-25% hospital capacity utilization. And I'm more dismayed to hear Dr. Alexander saying now that we've come down to maybe even 10%. So it's coming down more, not going up. So of course, we are happy to hear that the government is going to be giving an impetus to the healthcare infrastructure with 8,100 crore rupees. It's going to be having only a capacity and a multiplier effect. So the impact will be 27,000 crore rupees because it'll be only gap funding for 30%. The rest 70% has to come from central government or state government or private companies as stakeholders. But these issues are not enough. 
So I've written to the Prime Minister after he announced that, look, medical devices and even other products for making India, it's time for you to be vocal about local. So I immediately wrote to him, our biggest issue is cash flow. We need that oxygen. Our manufacturer's payments have not been paid by the government by six months to one year in many cases. Private hospitals have not paid us for two months to three months. If we have to be standing to serve them, we cannot be their financiers. We are MSMEs. There's a limit as to what the banks can finance us. And these are tenders we have to be competitive. So first and foremost ask is that the government should pay NHA and all CTHS outstanding to the hospitals in private healthcare. So private healthcare pay our suppliers. In public healthcare is the same thing. Immediate pay, we're not asking for subsidies. Give us our cash for what we are owed. So we have got money to run up business. Number two, mobile phones were not being made three years back in the country. In three years, we've got a huge thriving industry. How? Just by correcting the import duty to 15 to 20%. The same thing we're asking. If you continue to have custom duty at 0% or 5% or 7.5%, manufacturers who were making before will keep on importing. We don't make hot water bottles. We don't make mercury thermometers. We don't make digital thermometers. Now government says every building must have a thermometer for digital checking of the forehead. Until February, not a single manufacturer was there in the country. Now we've got four. But even I know, honestly, these four are just importing the component from China and Taiwan and doing tabletop assembly. This is not manufacturing. We have to mold everything and manufacture everything. So our ask to him also was in the public health care, give preferential pricing to Indian manufacturers like done in every other country in the world. Russia does it. America does it. China does it. Every country in the World Bank, where World Bank allows them to use their finance, is a 15% price preference clause. GFR 153 was amended, Mr. Guruswami, two years back. Why doesn't our country use it? WT allows it. Why doesn't our country use it? We've sought that any product which has got more than 50% domestic content, please allow 15% price benefit. For anything more than 40% domestic content, please allow 10% price benefit. For anything more than 25% domestic content, please allow 5% domestic, 5% uh, price, uh, price benefit. So there's more motivation to make everything in the country. So it can be really be called local, not right, just coming right. in from abroad and put a sticker made in India. Right, right. So this, along with regulation of MRP, because what's been happening in the country has been completely wrong. Hospitals, they need to be profitable now. They have to be low cost to be affording be affordable to the patients. If patients have to go to private hospitals and find them to be competitive and affordable compared to public health care now, certainly public health care is now more demand than private. So private has to now compete with public. The only way private can compete with public is by reducing their cost. They have never looked at their costs. Last 10 years, they're looking only at their profits. And for looking at their profits, they have been looking at products, products medical devices with higher MRPs more margins, so they have more profits, not looking at lower cost. Now they should look at lower cost, not at higher MRP, and by doing that, they can reduce, and they must become more efficient. Unless they become more efficient and do proper cost accounting, they will not be able to be competitive like they are in the industry. For quality, the government needs to bring in the medical device law. We have got now the all products covered under the Drugs Act from 1st of April. Now imagine if the ventilators were covered under the Drugs Act two years back. Do you think from ventilators we would have made a capacity from 3,300 ventilators per year to 300,000 ventilators per year? In February, we made 5,000 ventilators between 10 manufacturers. This month, we'll be making 33,000 ventilators from 14 manufacturers. Next month, we'll be making 50,000 ventilators from these 14, 15 manufacturers. Would it be, have been possible by a drug act? In six months, you can't even get a license impossible with validations of a high technology, with clinical trials and all those evaluations. So we have to have something which is more flexible. Now we are seeking foreign countries, 
So this week we'll be having a webinar with the Japanese government and Japanese industry, inviting them for collaborations and joint ventures with Indian companies. So more technology inflow can happen. Similarly, for Korea, we are reaching out to Singapore, to Germany, to Sweden, etc. COVID can be a silver lining for healthcare and a silver lining for medical device industry. Let's see how we can use it. I look forward to your views, Mr. Mohan Guruswami. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv Nath. Really, you have uh, covered every requirement, every pain point, our strengths, our gaps, and opportunities. And uh, among the healthcare sector, this is one segment, consumables and devices, which has really excelled over the last uh, 50, 60 days. However, some concerns keep coming regarding mom and pop shops, which have come up with the no or nil quality management. So those are aspects that we'll have to cover. Yes. Now, I take this one moment. Uh, yeah. Sorry for cutting in. Uh, for addressing this, in the last two weeks, we've trained more than 80 manufacturers on quality management systems by having online training for these new manufacturers, especially from the garment industry. Good. Good. They should know what is required for the medical device and medical application. Excellent. And medical devices consist of seven elements, electronics, equipments, instruments, implants, disposable consumables, and IVD reagents. These are all medical devices. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So now, uh, first of all, sincere thanks, uh, Dr. Mohan Guruswami. It was, uh, I really appreciate your patience. And now, finally, everything boils down to economics, finance, EBITDA margins. Already Mr. Nath has uh, mentioned that private hospitals are not very fair. So this uh, journey continues among us. But uh, finally, if everything has to come back, consumer sentiment has to uh, improve, uh, labor laws need to recover, poor people need to get back to work, and finally Indian economy need to come back to a growth trajectory. Over to you, sir, and uh, your insight, your experience will really benefit us. Thank you very much. It was very interesting because it took me back to a time in my life which I forgot. When I came out of Ahmedabad in 1970, uh, I set up a business manufacturing medical electronic equipment. Wow. And for six years, I ran that business. I used to make uh, ECG recorders, monitors, and I was supplying intensive care units to different hospitals in Bombay. Um, and I installed the first uh, color 16 bed monitoring station in Anavati Hospital in Bombay wow. in, in the mid 70s. News to us. Uh, but uh, I, I also sold to government hospitals. But unfortunately, those days, the biggest consumer, uh, the buyer was the government. So what I sold to Nanavati Hospital, the same system would be sold to a government hospital for about twice the cost. Because there was an in-between system of markups with government purchases. Well, that's a fact of life. Yeah. This field is highly corrupt, corrupted because government is a bulk purchaser of equipment. Even the military is not exempt from this. And that was my experience. Out of six years, I got a good price for my company. I sold it and I went to study economics at Harvard. So, uh, and this medical electronics, to some extent, paid for my expedition to the US to study again. And so I have, I was recalling those days when I had to stand with my bag in front of not medical administrators, but in front of purchase offices and, and purchase departments in different. Uh, directorates of medical services and, and all that. But it's not easy, as you know, the Prime Minister is talking about, uh, about self-reliance. In the modern day, um, manufacturing is becoming specialized. Uh, you have to import parts, components from different countries who have the scale of economics. You can aggregate them. You say that, you know, I will have a go back to the old Soviet system of zero imports is not going to be possible. 
Now, even in pharma, today we find that almost 30% of our basic chemicals come from China. You suddenly can't say, I will stop importing and I'll make it all here. And if you make it all here, you won't have this economy as a scale for it. So we'll have to go cleverly and carefully. We have to build up specializations, and that will take time. And the medical field today is, you know, uh, we've had this COVID panic now for the last, I call it a panic, because it doesn't compare with the influenza we had in 1957, where we it came to India in May. By June, we had a million cases. And by the end, by the time it finished, it took 57,000 lives. Even the H1N1 virus, uh, which came in, in 2000, I think, you know, 2000, whatever, uh, took 2,800 lives. This virus is created, to me, you know, I'm, I'm a little taken, by, taken aback at the spread of this panic and the pandemic. And it is uh, created an unprecedented situation in the world which we have never seen. All our theories say that you will have economic contraction or you will have this kind of situation when you have a mismatch between fiscal and monetary policies, you have a run on banks, you have a, a collapse of the stock market, you have hyperinflation. None of these things have been prescribed in the textbook as to what's happening. Suddenly, suddenly one day, all countries, all the big economies in the world, just shut down half or a third of their economies. In India, 60% of our GDP comes from consumption. And in the month of March, April, May, we have contracted that con consumption to almost 20% of its pace. So if you, have, if you do this kind of, and then in India has another unique situation. We have an organized sector, we have a urban sector, which is modernized. And then we have this institution of migrant labor. No other country has this daily wage migrant labor. China has migrant labor, but they are on contracts. They get yearly salaries, they get monthly salaries, and they're given accommodation, they stay in hostels. I've been to China dozens of times. The condition might be hard, but the workers will stay in hostels. And with beds, with nutrition source. Unlike India, where 126 million people were rendered jobless one day, in one day, with four hours notice, with no preparation. I suspect now, by the time this whole thing is through, that more people will die out of starvation-related illnesses and deaths. Already, highways you're seeing every day, on average, 20 people are dying in, in accidents. Today, just now, before I came to this room, 18 people died in, or in Arabia in uh, truck accidents. Migrants running back home in fear. The first thing the government should have done is to not create fear. They said there was huge fear fermented and things have got out of control. Now, no other country in the world has, a hundred and, has 200 million daily wages. Daily wages. And I have done studies where I have shown that the average food expenditure of a daily wage household accounts for 90% of its income. So if you don't have a daily wage, you can't be hungry. That's why all the people are angry. They're breaking out of their camps. And what social distancing can you have in a city like Bombay when the density of population is 73,000 people per square mile? And in Dharavi, it's eight lakhs per square mile. So what, and in Delhi, in Jafarabad, there are nine to 10 people in a room and 27 people use one toilet. So what social distancing can you have? Jafarabad has a density of, of almost 100,000 people per square mile. So, you know, we should have provided for them. We could have had field kitchens. We could have done direct benefit, transfer of benefits. Nothing was done. Today, after all this is over, the government has announced 500 rupees per direct Jandan account three for three months. That's 500, 500, 500. Some state governments have given a little more, depending on their 
circumstances. Telangana government, I mean, has is giving two thousand. Now, how do you expect these people to survive on these wages and this kind of money with no provisions? And there's no realization of at all. For the first 15 days, 20 days, I was watching television and I was trying to, when I was coming on shows, I was trying to tell them that this is an issue. And people are not interested, there's no market for this. Now, it's all fine banging thalias and light, lighting candles, but you've got to look after people. So you had an unprecedented situation where now, after all this tamasha took place, we had a stimulus package. They called it 20 lakh crore stimulus package. We announced as 10% of GDP. People like me had written for 10 lakh crores. But we said that it should be a stimulus. That means that money which comes from outside the system and you bring it there and inject it into the system. Not roll over what you're already doing. You don't do 75,000 crores worth of procurement in, in April and May and, and, and in March and say that we brought this money to the system. It is not that the regular operations. All the lending which is taking place is regular operations. There's no tax break. The total, I've been looking at the list today of you know, different financial agencies have said, we are spending less than 1% of GDP on stimulus. In my own calculations, the total amount is 63,000 rupees, additional money, new money, which is about 0.3% of GDP. Now, you have to wake up to this. Everybody is sensing an opportunity. You're not going to be self-reliant. And what is the, what are you getting prepared for when there's no medicine for this? There's no vaccine. There's no treatment. Nobody knows what medicine you're going to have for this. And at the end of it all, we have a casualty today of, you know, case fatality, there was less than 2%. States like Kerala, 0.6%. The lesson of Kerala is the lesson for the country. That you have to invest in basic medical care primary medical care, and you know you can't get away with spending 1.6% of your GDP on healthcare. The lowest healthcare expenditure in the world. Even countries in Africa spend more money than this. We just don't care for people in this country. What is, why are less people dying in India? There's a paradox there. People, less people are dying because our life expectancy is only 67. And mortality, increases when you're over 70. That's your people in my age group. We are the ones who are at risk. The mortality, that's why Italy had high mortality rates and Britain had high mortality rates because their old age cohort is big. Fortunately for India, the above 65 cohort is only 6% of the population. 80% of the people who even are positive are asymptomatic. Now, is this the first pandemic we had? What about 57 we had in 1918? This is the third big, and you know, cholera, which took in 1952. I remember those days I was a kid, I had cholera. One million people died in India. And the population in India was one third of what it is today. I think we should get a hang of this on the scale of this. And we should be pressing for more health budgets, more beds, more hospitals, more doctors. Look at our doctor to 100,000 people to a doctor ratio. Look at our nursing staff, 100,000 people to a, look at that ratio. And you, today I, I will bet you today that we'll have tens of thousands of respirators and ventilators sitting in warehouses unclear. I think we, we have lost his communication, uh, Dr. Guruswami. So, uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Guruswami is one voice which is uh, very transparent. People respect for his views. He touches ground realities and actual situation. At the same time, it is also a fact that Collectively, India has come out quite well in this fight against COVID-19. And uh, I should say that there are a lot of success stories when we come together. 
Kerala initial 20 days was having highest number. Today, the number is at the bottom. It's a success story. Yes, yes Mr. Dr. Goroswami, please. Yeah, sorry, you got cut. <laughs> Sami doesn't want to, doesn't like what I, I've, I've been saying. But no, 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 no. ICC welcomes all views, sir. <laughs> point, point, point is that the health industry, if I call it that, health sector, should be pressing for higher expenditures, overall expenditures, primary health care. You're going to get more beds, you're going to get more buildings. You got to get more hospitals over here, more doctors, better professional qualifications. Now, overall standards are extremely poor in the country. Now let's realize that. We might be giving the world doctors. And this, this pandemic, this, this virus is not going away. Even if you have vaccines, it is going to be there. You can only bend the curve a bit. And you got to be ready for that. There's no, no time, no need for knee-jerk reactions. What we're saying is, you know, the, the, I think there's a pandemic of fear now. More than the real pandemic. We've still got 57,000 people died in the 57 and 58,000 in the 57 influenza. Where are we today? 3,000? Yes. Each one and one took 2,800 people. Yeah. So I think we should get a fix on it. It's not it's not a killer like diphtheria or you know or or um, Ebola or whatever. It is. It takes as many people. Even in the U.S., they say that the number of deaths is less than what you have for seasonal influenza. I think the climate of fear which has descended on us should go first. And people in industry, people in the in the sector, have a responsibility to it. And then this is a time with this climate to plead, press for. One more than 1.6. We should have a target of raising it to four, five. Even a country like Brazil, eight percent. This is what we should be aiming for. Not immediate gains. That you know, I will add this. I'll do that. I'll do this. All of it to do it. In the crisis, we can do it. But we need to get more institutional changes and a new system of getting better professionals in, in the field, medical doctors, you know, uh, the quality standards of the uh, doctors are very abysmal now. Look at the Indian Medical Council. It's been a web of corruption. I know how uh, medical colleges are getting accreditation, how much money has to be paid each time the team comes to inspect. This is not a way to run this critical sector. All our institutions are suffering from this malice. If this crisis is used to create new standards, you people in the sector have a responsibility to create new standards. But if you see it as a business opportunity, it's not going to be much of a business opportunity. You know, a few people can make killings. And nothing is going to change. But, right. so, you know, I think, you know, I. One last point I'd like to make is that, you know, where is the money going to come from is always the question. We have got today 77 lakh crores sitting in bank deposits, fixed deposits. Even if you tap 5% of that and say that we will give you bonds against that, emergency bonds, 5% bonds will give you, and take that money and use it for the stimulus. You can, you've got $490 billion sitting in American banks getting 0% interest. Bring back 80, 90 billion dollars, monetize it, and put it in an investment fund. This is money. You know, everybody's taking pay cuts, except government employees. 11.4% of our GDP is used to pay for these guys. Have they given up leave travel benefit? If you give up LTC, you'll say one lakh crores. Let them take a 20% cut for this period. There's no giving by those people. All people are jobless, or people in private companies are taking cuts. Everybody's taking cuts. Doctors are suffering, engineers are suffering, workers are without jobs, except government employees. This is a nation within a nation, our superstructure, which 
feels no pain. Unless you make them feel pain, you will not get change in this country. And look at this high wage on clearance as well. A, a police constable who does little more than a, being a, as a beat constable with no professional skills gets 50, 60,000 rupees a month. It's basic wage. And what do you pay your security guard in your hospitals? I think we've got to get a rain on none of this. And a new system of governance where you know, where a, a government doctor will know, should, cannot cost you, cost the system 50, 60,000 rupees a month. The government doesn't have that money. It would just get a system of para, para, paramedicals and all these things. I think this is the kind of debate we should be having in the sector. How do you seize the opportunity and create a new health environment in this country? Thank you very much. Sorry for haranguing you guys, but you know, that's how I feel, at least strongly on the subject. No, Dr. Mohan Guruswami, real pleasure to hear your insight and uh, you raise real pertaining points which are practical, which most of us face and most of us know, but half the time they remain under the carpet. But what you have come out very clearly is that fear should go. We have to quickly learn to live with COVID-19. Secondly, we need to really stand up and look at budget allocated towards health. We can't be 1%, 2%. Anything below 6% of GDP will not help this country to rise in terms of health care. Also, not many of us understand, but you clearly indicated an additional 10 lakh crore COVID support budget should come separately, which should not be mixed with other uh, budgets already in the pipeline. And bottom of the pyramid, the people who are foundation to our labor community need to be addressed. And if we have to implement a good health system, uh, quality human capital in healthcare space need to be trained both in numbers and in quality. Sincere thanks for your insight. Now, we have a few questions from the participant, which I'll take. Uh, this goes to, I think, Dr. Alexander. What uh, Mr. Neeraj Kumar has written that non-COVID hospital, should they be uh, testing before IPD admission? So uh, he is talking about a hospital which is termed as non-COVID, and if a patient goes, who he or she needs an admission, should there be a COVID test? Uh, ideally, I think, yes, that would be the situation. Uh, but as I said earlier, uh, we do not, we are nowhere near there in uh, the, the capability of testing. So it is not possible to do that. So in view of that, uh, in fact, more important than that is, is to take universal precautions. Okay. But... Uh, we keep saying a lot of patients are unsymptomatic and if a non-COVID patient goes, how the caregivers will safeguard themselves? Uh, as I said earlier, even if you have testing facilities, and that is not there in most of the states, even if you are able to provide testing to all the people who come and all the providers, you will still get a 30% false negative. So the answer is assume everybody is COVID positive and take precautions, like we did for HIV. But uh, somehow, uh, doc, uh, somehow, Mr. Doshi, and uh, uh, one controversy came up regarding rapid uh, testing, IgG, IgM. Now, that was one tool for any major OT or cath lab procedure. We doctors could have done and at least got a percentage of patient for whom there was uh, no issues in terms of being affected. And uh, uh, no, what I'm saying, you, can, you cannot reach that conclusion. Even if you have done the testing, you cannot reach that conclusion. You are, the best uh, strategy here to protect the health workers and the patient is to assume that every patient is a uh, carrier. Okay, so you are saying that with rapid testing, uh, with the high sensitivity, we cannot for sure say patient has been affected or is already affected by. Yeah, okay. I think yeah. Uh, it depends when you do the test. Uh, the first five days uh, later, days there, off, is, yeah. there is one. Number two is 
uh, the government hasn't given permission in many states to do it. So there are a lot of realistic uh, problems on the ground. So I think the best thing in the present circumstances, assume everybody is positive and take adequate precautions. I just want to correct one uh, misconception. I said that when this crisis started, hospitals were at 10% occupancy. But the last week, things have improved. It's 22%. I think, Rajiv, you got me wrong there. Yeah, means averagely it is still around 20 to 30 percent between that. Right it is now, going up. It's going up. It's going, going up. up. But uh, nevertheless, the OPD numbers are still not encouraging. It yeah. is the acute cases up. that are coming. Yeah, I think the area which needs to improve is elective surgeries. Uh, correct, uh, correct. The problem is the doctors are insisting on being tested before they go in, uh, before the patient goes for testing before they go. So that has created a bit of a problem. I have another question again from one of the participants, Dr. Rajiv Yadav, and he has made an observation and will like to know the comment. Now, uh, for reasons best known to few hospitals, they are not accepting cashless admissions on the pretext of COVID overload. What, is, what are your views on this? No, as I said, that most of the COVID the patients are being taken care of by the government. And uh, hospitals are actually looking forward to patients because they need to be financially sustainable, sustainable cashless or with cash. So this may be, uh, I mean, I, I'm not aware this, this situation exists uh, in any of our states that we were talking to. Uh, 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 hospitals turning away uh, non-COVID patients. I have a question for, uh, uh, from uh, manufacturing and Mr. Rajiv Chandra has raised this question that why not uh, bodies like uh, uh, consumable and both pharmaceutical not pushing for a specific standards. There is so much of confusion in terms of quality and uh, this apprehension recently it has been coming in media that uh, even with PP the infection rate in some of the High footfall COVID hospitals is uh, pretty high among caregivers in India. Yes, uh, Rajiv Nazi, will you be able to address this? Yes, this has been the biggest challenge because the enemy was unknown. Initially, it was thought that we have to have something which will be designed like you have to fight with Ebola. Later on, WHO revised its specifications and guidelines at the end of February, which were more workable. And it took us until March of end for Ministry of Health to come out with their guidelines and specifications. After that, we've been seeking the BIS to come out with national standards. They did come out with the emergency meeting on BCO and launched the Indian standards for PPE. But surprisingly, because the textile ministry and Ministry of Health for certain reasons that those standards might be clashing with their specification, create possibly a confusion which I fail to understand because these are voluntary standards. Mm -hmm. and this would have helped to address the quality issues in the private healthcare market and the non-government, uh, the non-central government market of the state uh, tenders. Because even till today, they're coming out with uh, specifications which are completely varying from one state to another. So a national standard was very much required and it was published and withdrawn immediately. We've been okay. seeking that standard to be issued and we've been seeking that all the PPE should be coming immediately under the Drug Act as a notified device with a limited time period of four weeks time or six weeks time so that good quality is only available and we address patient safety issues. Great, thank you. So uh, now I'll request Chairman Healthcare Committee ICC, Mr. Prachan Sharma to guide us and uh, do the conclusion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Raghavanshi and uh, all the panelists. It's been a very, very informative and indulging uh, conversation. Dr. Alex, thank you for reminding us about the real patients, people who are having MIs, people who require PTCAs, and those who are having coming with strokes. Literally, the whole country has forgotten them over the last two months. And I must thank you and congratulate you for your excellent work in releasing government outstanding, CGHS, CCHS, ESI. I think the only forum which has done real quality work in... Uh, pushing the government to, to start liquid, uh, moving some liquidity has been AHPI and under your and Dr. Gyani's leadership, it has been a really remarkable move. Thank you so much. 
I wish on a personal note I could ask you a speculative question as to what is the number of cases that you envisage by the end of this period that the country will see. But I don't know if a moderator will allow that to happen or not. So I'll leave it up to him. Now, uh, I'm very happy to hear Mr. Doshi and Mr. Nath. So both of you, sirs, you have uh, highlighted how strongly the country has performed over this last three months. We could not have expected that our MSME sector has done phenomenal work and has come up with solutions which even global large-scale economies and multi-billion dollar companies have failed to perform. So this small Jugaad concept of the country and how this entire <laughs> uh, pearls have been sort of niched together and both of your grasps on the subject and your uh, delivery in the matter is worth, removing, worth noticing. I wish I could once again ask that um, uh, Mr. Doshi that when does he expect the vaccine to come out? As you are a, 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 quite a well knowledgeable business person and you've been in the sector for many, many decades. So I can't resist asking you the speculative question. However, moderator will allow me to do so or not. This is called. No, no, sure, sure. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Nath, thank you for bringing all these small manufacturers together for establishing quality norms, for pointing out the issues where our country has done well, for pointing out issues where our country has sort of, uh, again, not done so well. So on the note of the ventilators, as a layman, I would like to know the currently that the ventilators that hospitals are buying are anywhere between 8 lakhs to 20 lakhs, depending on the quality specification. Once we start manufacturing in our country, what do we expect a Draeger or a MacKay system like ventilator to cost us in real terms? Would it be, what, what do you think is going to be the price range on those things? Well, the government currently is buying ventilators at below one and a half lakh rupees. Central government mm -hmm. in its last tender. Okay. But they're wanting to have from the manufacturers the specification of the performance of a 10 lakh rupee ventilator. Okay. Public health care is always like that. Can we make a for more? for two or three lakhs? Is it achievable? So I would say basically we'll put them into three categories. You know, but different performance like a Maruti car between a 1 lakh 10 lakh rupee car or 1 lakh to 3 lakh rupee ventilator. And then between 3 to 6 lakhs and then between a 9 to 12 lakh rupees ventilator. So a high end ventilator also is made in the country by few manufacturers, which is in that region, 9 to 10 lakh rupees which competes very well at maybe 40% price lower or half price of the imported ones. And that's the high specification level. Mr. Doshi? Yeah. Uh, regarding the vaccine. No, Mr. Doshi has promised that vaccine will be available yesterday. <laughs> Can I add here? Oh, Whenever Mr. Doshi's vaccine is available, Yes. HMT's auto disciple synthesis will be available. God grants <laughs> me that it will be available. As Raghavan C says, it is on the yesterday basis. Uh, both the men's Germany as well as the Oxford, both are working on a very fast way. And what we understand from our Indian company, that's a Serum Institute. Yes. A uh, few two days back, an interview with the MD of the Serum Institute. He was very much hopeful. They have started the manufacturing and it will be get clear from the clinical trial and everything by September. It, it will be available for the patients. That's what Hoppy has given and I believe him also. It's a very sincere and a <clears throat> very trustworthy company. So we all we all have to pray. Means it should be. This of the Mr. Raghuvanshi will come true. It should be on the yesterday basis. Thank you, Prasad. Thank you, sir. Dr. Thomas, would you like to have a number on how, how much is the maximum cases the country can witness? Uh, very difficult to say. All I can say is I think we'll be prepared uh, for the worst and pray, pray that it doesn't reach there. From the, on behalf of ICC Healthcare Committee, I would like to sincerely thank all of you. We have been extremely information sharing has been real, real gems of information. And Dr. Guruswami, such a senior person like yourself, we are glad to have you. Mr. Nath, your take and your perseverance in the matter has been really commendable. Mr. Doshi, your working and your um, information sharing has been absolutely fantastic. And Dr. Thomas, I have been a fan of yours for many years now, and it's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you, Dr. Raghavanshi, for bringing us together and coordinating this on behalf of ICC. It's really nice. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all panelists. Very interesting insights from Mr. Mohan. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Sharma.